Hey there YouTube, I'm Pruitt, this is Jim Davis, and today on WebDM we're gonna step outside the normal bounds of adventuring, right outside the door in fact, and adventure in the city. So let's get to see what... Sorry. <laughs> oh, he's, he's dead Jim. He's not gonna stay up there. He's dead Jim. <laughs> anyway. <clears throat> It's Urban Campaigns on WebDM. You can adventure all you want in your, your forests and your mountains. Let's get down in the city. Urban Campaigns. Urban Campaigns. Right? The back alley deals, right. you know. They're somehow set apart from other kinds of, of, mm -hmm. of campaigns where it's sort of like the urban adventure, the urban campaign, city adventure. It's seen as sort of a separate thing. Yeah. I, I like them because there's a lot of interesting stuff to do mm -hmm. in the urban environment in Dungeons and Dragons, and yeah. there's a lot of interesting ways you can kind of take it. Yeah. Um, but I find that they are often sort of described like I'm going to run an urban campaign or, or or an urban style adventure, and then there's all this sort of scrambling for like, well, what do I need? What do I want to do? You rarely see people like, man, I'm going to run an adventure in a forest. How do I do this? Right. And so for some reason, urban campaigns are set aside as this kind of special type of Dungeons and Dragons that needs a lot extra in order to make it work. But isn't it just basically a dungeon crawl with windows? <laughs> there is a right? sense in which the, the the city is just a type of dungeon. Right. Right. It's one of those things where you can read about it. You can read a bunch of guides and books and things. Watch our video, for instance, uh, on urban adventures. But you really need to, like, just try your hand at it. Just yeah. do it and see what you need because everybody's going to run it differently. I think there's some features to an urban campaign that do set it apart from, say, wilderness adventures or mm -hmm. a dungeon crawl. And and to that extent, I, I use sort of three um, rule books that, that I've kept around over the years yeah. uh, whenever I I'm prepping for an urban campaign, those would be the city-state of the Invincible Overlord, which is an exhaustive detailed account of sort of this one fantasy city. Now, I use the Necromancer Games version that was made for uh, third edition Dungeons and Dragons, but there are older versions of the city-state. And it's one of those things where it's like, do you want to know what's in that cellar of this particular room? Like every building in the city is mapped out in some way. Some right. of them very detailed, others just on the city map. And and the NPCs are there. But it's also a city where the bartender might be a 12th level fighter and where the merchant's bodyguard might be a troll. So it's kind of one of those settings where it's meant to be adventured in and it's meant to be adventured in with characters of all level because the way the city guard works and, and mm -hmm. sort of the characters you find. It's also very dense and not very well laid out. So it's a kind of a cumbersome rule book to use at the table. It's more of a prep, prepping reference. Right. You just want to have your, you know, your notes to go to what page. To go you to what page. You want to have to be right. digging that thing out. Yeah. The second one I use is uh, Lankmar City of Adventure. This is for second edition Dungeons and Dragons. I like it for the city geomorphs. They sort of like these blank city streets that you can use for a quick map if you need one. Most of the descriptions of the places are very brief, just giving you enough information about a neighborhood or a plaza mm -hmm. or a shop or something to get you going. And then, of course, it's like if you're looking to run more uh, adventures in the world of Fawford and the Grey Mouser, then you can, the, the sort of the supplement also covers that. And then the final one that I use a lot of is uh, the Urban Adventure Kit Vornheim. And I use that one not just for the specific locations that are, that are mentioned in it. For instance, you know, the, the one fight we did in our Maze of the Blue Medusa campaign in the Scholar's House. I used sort of a modified version of uh, one of the locations there. But there's also about half of the Vornheim uh, city kit is just rules for running at the table urban adventures. Sort of yeah. like how do you make a street map on the fly at the table in under five minutes? How do you improv an urban campaign where you might need to know what the interior of a place looks like. We've got tools and tips and tricks for all of that that are meant for ease of use at the table. Mm -hmm. I find it Im immensely useful uh, in that regard. Those are the three that I kind of use a lot, uh, a lot of when I'm prepping for an urban adventure, but at the same time, they're just suggestions and, 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 and guidelines. Right. What's the balance of detail that you like to use when creating your urban setting like hey right. when is it when is it too much like you know do we need to know what each flagstone <laughs> of the ground looks like right you know i mean i think the level of detail in city state of the overlord is is too much 
it, right. it's it's unwieldy in some ways. I think you know the, the flippant kind of uh, non answer is whatever you need is how much you need, but that does that's not necessarily helpful. Let's start with a map. I think that having a map that details precise streets and the locations of buildings in an urban campaign is not necessary. Yeah. I find most of those maps don't they're not useful for the players necessarily. Uh, they don't contain the kind of information you need as a GM. And so I tend to use relational maps. Mm -hmm. This is this location in relation to the others. And so the maps that I have for uh, for the urban campaigns that I run tend mm -hmm. to look more like a brainstorming kind of thing or a or a, uh, a a web of connections between different locations and people as opposed to the more traditional fantasy map of a street by street, block by block, here are the buildings kind of map. The other one that I use is obviously the stuff in Vornheim is meant for if you do need a map. If let's say you're using something as like a battleground or there's a fight that's taking place in the street. There are sort of procedurally generated rules for rolling dice and, and it's, almost, it's kind of innovative. You sort of like drop the dice on a piece of paper and where they land in relation to each other, sort of what the street looks like, what the interior of the building looks like. Oh. And then you build up from there. But I, I think the level of detail you need is 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 contingent. Like, are, are, are you running a neighborhood style campaign, sort of like street level Marvel, right? Yeah. Where you just need to know what's in Hell's Kitchen and the neighborhood there. In that case, you might want to detail like all the different NPCs the party's going to run into. Yeah. But if you're running like a city-wide campaign where the players are more movers and shakers at the city level, then you don't need to go down deep into the neighborhoods to get that kind of detail there. You just need to know the top level of the city. Who are the officials involved? Is there a mayor <laughs> or a governor or something like that? Uh, who are the major NPCs? What kind of groups or power brokers are in the city? Uh, that's what you need for, for a more overarching uh, urban campaign. How do you how do you like to make your urban campaign come to life as far as like, you know, the markets in place, the uh -huh. you know, all the, the the economy of the city, mm -hmm. like yeah. how it's run, you know, the kind the guard, the all that kind of stuff. Yeah. I, I like to start with like what is the architecture of the city like? Is there yeah. an overall architectural style that's unique to the city? Using the the setting that we're got going on in uh, Saber Dice, the great city of Oracala Palantine. There were a couple of features uh, architecturally that I wanted to be prominent in the in the city. So this is also an illustrative example of sort of like what you do as a DM as prep versus what comes out in play because a lot of these features haven't really made it into the game itself. Yeah. Even though when I was prepping for the game, they, they featured prominently. One of those was arcane architecture. Architecture meant to channel and uh, harness the latent magical energies of the location where this city was built up. So if you imagine like ancient Rome with the aqueducts and the monumental statues and monumental architecture, imagine if that was just had an arcane bent. Instead of an aqueduct, it's a channel for magical energy that they're bringing in from the countryside. That obelisk is there for a reason to serve as a nexus for mm. arcane energy, that kind of thing. Um, and then the other is just like, what are the building styles? What what do people, what do they build with? Is it brick? Is it mortar? Is it wood and, and timber kind of houses? Like, what is the feel for it? Can you give me a short snapshot description of what the average city in the place looks like? Is it cramped and crowded and muddy with a sort of overhang kind of feel? Is everything sooty? Is it, yeah. a, are they nice tree-lined boulevards with cobblestone streets that, that sort of lend itself to a more uh, pleasant uh, atmosphere. Mm. Um, yes, less those, chamber pots in the streets. <laughs> a list of neighborhoods. Like when you're thinking about your city, how many neighborhoods do you want? You know, you can look at real world cities kind of for that example and say go to Wikipedia or somewhere else and just like look up a big city. How many different distinct neighborhoods are there? There might be a lot. There might be like 20 or 30. That's probably too many for your game. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but if you only have like six or seven, that might be too few. So you're really just kind of like looking, are you are you going for something, an adventure that's gonna take place there for a couple of sessions before the party moves on? Mm -hmm. You probably don't need that much. If the city is gonna be your base of operations and a central feature of the campaign, then you might want a dozen or so separate and distinct neighborhoods where they are in relation to each other, a short description of what it's like to visit there. And then from there, as the campaign progresses, you flesh them out a bit more. Are they staying in neighborhood A a bit longer? So again, coming back to uh, Saver Dice, you know, you guys are in the neighborhood known as the Street of Spells. Yeah. And that consists of several different regions within the Street of Spells. But if you go further south, you're at the dockside. If you go far enough north, you're in the abandoned suburbs that are out yeah. there. Further east, you're into Goblin Town, and it's got a whole different character. And so if this were part of a much 
much larger campaign that we were playing, say, for years on end, then the city would grow and develop over the course of the campaign yeah. as you needed it. And, and, and much like, a, a, you know, a, say, a hex crawl campaign or something like that would. The most important question, I think, do you have to have were rats? Is that like, <laughs> is there an there, unwritten raw, there, <laughs> law in the books that say, if there's no were rats, we're gonna come in and we're gonna take your books away? They will burn your books. They'll yeah. take away your dice and smash them yeah. if you don't have were rats. I think the fact that the were rats in the sewers are such a common feature in Dungeons and Dragons, and of course, I love were rats in the sewers because I love Skaven in my sewers, right? Like who doesn't, that, love, who Skaven? doesn't love Skaven? Right, so there will always be some kind of humanoid rat monster yeah. in one of my fantasy sewers because that's just who I am and that's the, the kind of thing that I love. So you don't have to have them, but the reason that they're there is to reinforce a kind of fantastical element to yeah. your city. Yeah. There tend to be rats in sewers. This is a fantasy game, so instead of just normal rats, they're going to be were rats or R-O-U-S's, you know, sort of dire rats. I, I think that having them there is both a cliche. Mm -hmm. it, it, there, there might be players that roll their eyes at it. There might be people who are like, oh, of course there are were rats in there. But they're mm -hmm. a cliche for a reason. They add kind of a fantastical element to it. And yeah, why wouldn't you have a were yeah. rat? Well, I mean, kind of? they, they, they form a kind of the, the base organization from which all other organizations are built on. Usually <laughs> there's some form of thieves guild, <laughs> right. which guilds are an important part of an urban uh, right. setting like whether it's your merchants guild your you know your brewers guild your whatever mm -hmm. thieves assassins guild the guild system is is a good way of kind of portraying city life across your urban campaign whether it is a thieves guild which should maybe be more like a, a mafia style criminal family or as opposed to like a guild structure with like masters and journeymen and apprentices and things like that mm -hmm. although you might have a structure that's like that where you know, a local cut purse is brought into the guild and taken under the wing of a of a beggar or a, or a pickpocket or something like that, works their way up. Maybe there are competing guilds. I'm kind of of the opinion that most big cities, and, and if you're running a big urban campaign, you're probably running it in a big city, there should be competing guilds, Yeah. right? Not just one thieves guild that covers the entire city, but multiple ones, one per neighborhood. Yeah. And particularly if you're running a campaign where thieves and, and thievery is an important part of it, having those multiple guilds is going to create conflict and interesting alliances will form and things like that. What happens when your players want to start their own guild? I would let in them. The, in the middle of your urban campaign. In the middle of, I would let them, you know, and sort of work through that. Do you want to start your own guild, then what does that look like? Is that just the party forms the nucleus of that? Or is one party sort of party member breaking off and sort of forming their own guild on the side using mostly NPCs, maybe a second backup PC that they're running? Um, I, I think that that can be an interesting development. Let's say, let's take the Thieves Guild, for example. Say Party Rogue uh, wants to start their own Thieves Guild. They got beef with the established Thieves Guild, mm -hmm. and now they're going to try to undermine them. Well, what does that look like? It's probably going to start small, nibbling away at the edges till they get enough power to pull off a big heist or to undermine the power base of the Thieves Guild. Now they've started a war, and there's a turf war that goes on. Does that take place in the streets? Are they disrupting daily city life right. to uh, to get back at one another, or does it take place clandestinely? In, in Oracala Palantine, that kind of thing takes place in the Undercity. It's sort of established that you don't do those kinds of things above ground. That's dis that's disrespectful. That's unseemly. Mm -hmm. Anything goes in the Undercity. Yeah. And so the f silent wars, the cold wars, the spying, everything like that uses the sewers and catacombs and cellars and basements and all those things that are connected in the city. And it's just known by the populace that if you go down there, you play by a different set of rules. But up here, we don't knife people in the street. We don't do those kinds of things. We keep things nice and orderly. Uh, yeah. And then you purge down below. Yeah, we're all civilized up here, but you know, you break those rules, we'll take you down to another city, maybe we'll break your legs. Maybe we'll break your legs. But yeah, like, um, like you said, you know, you, 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 all that takes place down in the catacombs underneath the city, there, there's still opportunity to dungeon delve right. in a city. First off, the, the sewer adv adventure is a classic Dungeons and Dragons thing. Venturing into the sewers, whatever it is that's down there, whether it's rats or mm -hmm. were rats or weird oozes that are out of control mm -hmm. or cultists or vampires or whatever it is. Yeah, in our vigilante game, it's it's flesh golems and vampires. It's flesh golems and vampires. Uh, I, I think that the sewers are a good place because they do present that kind of classic dungeon environment uh, that the players are very familiar with, that you can easily craft adventures for, and have the advantage of the fact that they're placed of rest is could be like literally right next door yeah and so instead of having the city and the adventure location and the wilderness travel in between 
it's like, well, we're staying at the tavern, and then, like, we'll just go around back, pop open the cellar door, walk down the steps, and now we're there. Yeah. I, I think having the city built on top of a dungeon offers a ton of role-playing possibilities, because it's like, what happens if the monsters get out? Well, I like the idea of a dungeon that influences the area around it, mm -hmm. so what does that mean for the city at large? Are there entities within the dungeon that exert influence or, or power over the city, or vice versa? A good example of this would be Waterdeep and Skullport in Forgotten Realms, mm -hmm. where Waterdeep is uh, upper city of that, then there's the Underdark below, there's Under Mountain, which is kind of the dungeon underneath. Uh, nearby Waterdeep, and then Skullport is sort of the dark mirror to Waterdeep. There doesn't have to be this break between city and dungeon. It can be sort of one continuous thing. Right. And that <laughs> really allows for uh, a different style of campaign as opposed to having that break uh, where the wilderness is. Well, yeah, and also, you know, if you go down and you piss off the wrong thing and you try to make an escape, uh -huh. it's not like you can lose them in the woods before you head back home. Right, no, right? you gotta like lose them in the alleyways. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Before you head back home. Before you head back home. And so it brings up a lot of interesting things. Like, what do you do with the monsters in Dungeons and Dragons in an urban campaign? Like, are there monsters in your city? Yeah. Are, do, you, do you incorporate those fantastical elements and make them a part of city life? How does magic work for your city? Are there people, or, or do they use magic to clean up the place? Do they magic right. to maintain it? Right, because I mean that's pretty much you just worked everything in into uh, your setting in mm -hmm. in Saver Dice. Yeah, I, that's sort of where the concept of the gutter fay came from because I was yeah. like, how? What are some of the fantastical things that could take place in that? One of that was where there are people, there are fay. And in this case, they're not like brownies living in tree stumps that you mm -hmm. don't want to wander into their mushroom ring. It's brownies that are living in an old rain barrel behind the tavern that clean up the dung that yeah. gets left in the city streets. Yeah. And Brown, you got a little gutter fairy over there named Oscar living in a trash can. <laughs> living in a trash can, <laughs> right. And you leave out a little saucer of milk for him or a little pitcher of beer and and, and, and that's it. And you wake up and the city streets are clean or your right. the cobblestones in front of your uh, in front of your tavern are mended or you know something like that or your chimney was swept out. Right. So those little things that maintain a city, I shoved all of that off onto the tiny little fairies that live around there. That's why people treat them well. They, they offer them little gifts in exchange for it, and you treat them poorly to your peril. They right. will do, they can, you know, they, you just don't. But at the same time, they don't have, they can make life a nuisance for you. They're not going to make it life completely miserable for you if you do upset them. This is more of a nuisance. Yeah, yeah, I mean, you're not going to trip over <laughs> something, fall down the stairs and die. Um, but there were other elements. Like, one thought that occurs to me is, like, law and, and the courts of law and the enforcers of law are all very sort of human-centric and obviously drawing from uh, Western legal tradition that makes its way into Dungeons and Dragons. But what if your system of law was a sphinx shows up once a week, holds court literally in like a, a, a square or an intersection yeah. or a marketplace or something, and the people petition this sphinx who can detect thoughts and has a zone of truth, and they just go like, hey, I, this is a dispute I have, this is the person I have beef with, and you present your case, and the sphinx is like, here's my judgment. Yeah. And then uh, if you disobey, then the sphinx will eat you. <laughs> Question, is that Sphinx's name Judy, and does he or she have a show? It could be Judy. I would love that. I would love... The Judy? No, uh, you're wrong. No, you're wrong. Uh, but there's others, you know, uh, Atyugs and Oozes that take care of trash. What other kind of monsters are there? Like, that's kind of why I like City State of the Invincible Overlord, because it's kind of like, yeah, this gym dealer, why wouldn't he have two trolls? That, that keep the riffraff out. And, and, you know, and those trolls work for money and they have a home. Yeah. And they're part of this urban society. How do you maintain the law? How do you prevent it from being just a total like free for all disaster zone kind of area? I think that, um, well, it could be, right? You could have a lawless city yeah. in which the neighborhoods are broken up and, and the, the, the powerful crime lords and war bosses and who have street gangs vie for control of the city and, and that's just kind of how it is. Or you have one where there's an established city watch and they're capable of dealing with fantastical threats and mm -hmm. you just deal with it. Maybe there's a, a, a mages component to the city watch that uh, keeps magic users in order or, or, or not. And those are just the kinds of things that you need to think about. Maybe you fall somewhere in, in the middle. So all this taken into account, mm -hmm. Jim Davis, what, what, what would you say your, what are your top three things that a DM should, should think about, worry about when with regards to their city campaign? Considering the uh, sensational details of, of, of what life is like so that when you're describing the characters walking through the city, you can give good details. What does it smell like? What's it 
feel like? What are the sights that they see? What does morning look like in the city? What does afternoon look like? What does the evening look like? Is this a city that's lit at night? Or is it like a lot of medieval and early modern cities where this place is dark at night and you can get lost in the city streets? And mm -hmm. there's a reason why you don't go out at night. Yeah. Because that's when the cut purses are out. That's when the murderers come out. Yeah. And um, all the races with dark vision are waiting for all the hum the squishy sure. humans to come into the dark the places. The squishy humans. And, or is it kind of one of those things where, where the Mage Rights Guild is responsible for maintaining the lights of the city and they, they have a, a, a cantrip or a ritual or something like yeah. that? that. It's like Vegas. Them. Like Vegas. I mean, that's sort of what they're doing in Sharn in, in Eberron. And, mm -hmm. and magic pervades that particular city and is, is so omnipresent. It creates a more modern style city and mm -hmm. they have big tall buildings and sky taxis and drift globes and so it's the sensational details of what's going on what does it smell like and then the other one is like what do people eat what does daily life look like for for the inhabitants of the city uh, do they work there uh, if they do, what, what sort of trades are practiced there? In a medieval city, in a lot of ways, they need to be self-sufficient. It's not mm -hmm. like modern cities where they have like, where you can have very specialized economies in the city. A lot of medieval cities are gonna be, there's, there's a little bit of everything there. Yeah. So are you going to the craftsman's quarter where all the different trades are practiced? Why are they all pa practiced there? Because having them all in one location is convenient for everybody. Yeah, it's you just know. easier. Once you know sort of what the physical details of the city look like, the sights, the smells, what they hear, coupled with the daily uh, life of what life is like in the city, now you're armed with the tools to describe all different kinds of neighborhoods and what's going on at particular times of day. You have an idea of what's happening as the party moves through a particular neighborhood or area, and that gives them uh, a, a feel of sort of what the color of the city is like, yeah. what's, what's going on. And uh, you know, all those innocent people and, and all those businesses are just collateral damage, <laughs> and just collateral you have to start damage. thinking about that as your, as your adventures go through the city, right. unlike a normal dungeon crawl. I absolutely do. Yeah, and, yeah. And, I, and that's what makes it fun. And so you, you, you have an opportunity for colorful NPCs that the party can run into. Uh, services that they need are right there at hand. And I think there's more that you can do with a city campaign just because you have a wealth of NPCs to draw from, as opposed to like the traditional dungeon crawl where there might be NPCs there, but the party is also sort of like, the assumption is we're going into the dungeon to kill things, yeah. uh, and that kind of thing. Or there's uh, like a wilderness campaign where the NPCs might be few and far between, and it's more about exploring the environment, things like that. The urban campaign is about the NPCs, and particularly if you have a lot of them or a large organization that's featured in the campaign, having a, a sort of cast list of NPCs and their relationship to each other is gonna be pretty important as well. All right, yeah. Yeah, okay. I thought I had to fart. <clears throat>